Hello, everyone. My name is Angela Moran, and I am an urban farmer in Victoria, British Columbia. I co-own the Mason Street City Farm in Victoria Aquaponics. And today I'd like to share with you a little bit of my journey in becoming an urban farmer. And I'd also like to share with you an honest perspective about growing up with very little connection to my food system, rediscovering an honest relationship with food and a responsible relationship with food, and recognizing the power of being part of a community food system that allows others to reclaim that same relationship. So, this is where my journey started. I grew up in Niagara Falls, Ontario, the daughter of two English hairdressers. It's quite the hair we have there. <laughs> and, yeah, it was a, a very typical North American upbringing. Middle-class family, spent a ton of time in the suburbs. I'd head to the grocery store with my mom, and everything was in season all of the time. I would head um, to my downtown core to see a line of boarded-up shops with failing business after failing business, trying to make a go of it. And it was all completely normalized to me, and I didn't question it because I didn't know any different. I also spent a fair amount of time um, visiting family in Detroit, Michigan, and similar Rust Belt towns. The Rust Belt encompasses a fairly large area of the northeastern United States and southern Ontario. There were primarily single industry manufacturing towns that really represent the birthplace of mass production in North America, and they fell prey to corporate and municipal negligence during the last half of the 20th century, seeing a lot of those manufacturing jobs, which really built our modern-day middle class, exported to southern states and to developing countries where labor was cheaper. And it's called the Rust Belt because if you visit some of these cities, what you will see is a host of abandoned factories and houses that are literally rusting in place. So I, I spent the latter half of my time in southern Ontario at Brock University, sitting just on the grassy knoll there, mostly skipping class. And I spent that time reflecting on all of this exposure to urban decay and abandonment, and I, I wondered if what was happening um, in the Rust Belt was just a blip in the radar in a, in a geopolitical and economic history in time, or if it was a sign of things to come. So as I was doing all of that reflecting, I was also learning about resilient communities and, and decentralized economies, and I decided in that moment that I needed to stop talking about the skills and the knowledge that was needed to help redesign and rebuild our communities, that I wanted to go out and actually acquire those skills so that I could take part in that redesign and that rebuild. So that's what I did. I went and visited many, many regenerative farming communities throughout the, the Western Hemisphere. And throughout that time, I couldn't help but, the researcher in me couldn't help but continually be going back and checking in on the backdrop to my childhood. Researchers and photographers and journalists are flocking to these cities to capture an empire in decline. The stories coming out of these cities, they oscillate from unrealistic hope to utter despair. There are some of the most innovative minds of our time that are growing food and creating technologies that are fit for a post-carbon world. They are just trapped in an outdated economic and political paradigm that has them stuck in an unending cycle of, of urban poverty. And quite often when we look at these, these types of photos, there's a very strong sentiment of hope that is, that is created. What I want to illustrate today is that urban farming, it can't stand alone in stopping the decline of Detroit and, and similar cities like that in North America. And I also don't want to squash that sentiment of hope because the Rust Belt is rising. But I do want to warn of the dangers of blind hope when we're not fully informed about the limitations of our present political and economic systems. So after all of this collective experience in the first half of my life, I decided that my skill set could be best utilized farming in the city, and I was the lucky lady to take over the lease at the Mason Street City Farm eight years ago, where I've been building a living classroom with countless community members, and chickens are central to our model at the Mason Street City Farm. They're built right into our crop rotation, and they provide a quick and easy fertility and protein. We grow a high-end salad mix and a variety of culinary crops that we sell to local restaurateurs and area markets. We have top bar bees, which is an organic, 
non-invasive approach to beekeeping that really prioritizes the health of the bee. And quite often, I've been very interested by rediscovered and innovative approaches to growing food. This is the yellow heritage plum on Mason Street City Farm. When this plum is in full bloom, I plant my peas. When the lilac is just about to bud, I plant my onion seed. And this is an approach to growing food called phenology. It's about observing and making connections between the cues that plants and animals take from the climate. Because we're farming in very uncertain times, amidst a very unstable climate, and it's, I can't really rely on a date in the farmer's almanac anymore. I need a more reliable set of checks and balances. And another very innovative approach to growing food that I discovered five years ago is aquaponics. Aquaponics is growing fish and vegetables together in a recirculating system. It provides higher yields and it uses 90% less water. And this is Will Allen of Growing Power in Milwaukee. And 20 years ago, he started a three-acre farm with aquaponics being one of the primary uses. And they're growing a million pounds of food a year. And the further I dove into the possibilities of aquaponics, I decided there was nothing that was going to stop me from building a system like this in Victoria. Well, well maybe one thing was going to stop me from <laughs> building that system right away. <laughs> I, I had a child, and myself and my partner, we, we started a family four years ago, and we learned very quickly what can happen to families of limited means in a city like Victoria, BC. Quite often, we found ourselves on the edge of a financial cliff, um, fighting to provide a, a decent quality of life for our family, and we, we were lucky. I was leasing a piece of land, and I had the skills to grow local organic food. If I didn't have those skills, nor did I have that access to land, I would not have been buying local organic food. And I've experienced firsthand the wrong side of economic segregation, and as I was crafting my business, and as I was becoming a mother, I felt that I had no option but to constantly be challenging our present organic movement and who had access to that food and who didn't and why. And at the outset of this whole journey, the vision was to create an urban farming school in the city, to offer education to reskill Victoria residents to become food sovereign citizens. But that vision was seeming very out of reach once I became a mother, so I asked a dear friend, Jesse Brown, to join forces with me and help bring this vision into reality. And one year ago, almost to the day, we launched an online crowdfunding campaign to raise funds to build Victoria's first greenhouse aquaponic system and to um, offer an educational internship program in the city. And we did it. We, we, we surpassed our funding goal with 90% of the funds coming from southern Vancouver Island, which is a real testament to what Vancouver Island residents are ready for in their food system. And in one short year, we built Victoria's first greenhouse commercial aquaponic system and provided Victoria's first urban farming internship program. Our design started with a simple flood and drain aquaponic system. Our greenhouse allowed us to catch all 2,000 plus gallons of water for our system. We upcycled and recycled as many building materials as possible. And this is how a flood and drain aquaponic system works. The fish are swimming in the tanks below the grow beds and they are, they're peeing and pooing in the water, and they're creating a nutrient-laden water. That water is, has high levels of ammonia in it, which is very toxic to the fish. That water is pumped up into the grow beds. The plants are growing in a soilless hydroponic medium, which is host to millions of nitrifying bacteria. That nitrifying bacteria converts the ammonia into nitrites and into nitrates, which is then available for the plants to uptake. And while all of these chemical and biological processes are happening, the water is being cleaned, it is being filtered, and it is being gravity-fed back down to the tanks. There is no need to weed, there is no need to water, and there is no need to build soil. It literally cuts the labor of the farmer in half. And aquaponics can really start to address some of the issues that we're facing feeding people in the world. We can literally build this system right on top of concrete. We can build it on top of com contaminated soils. And in the wake of Fukushima and a whole host of issues that are threatening our oceans, aquaponics, in the very least, can ease the burden that is placed on our oceans to feed our growing populations. And in return, we get a safe, healthy, local, organic vegetable and protein source. 
And this is what our little farm has been able to accomplish in the last 10 years with an incredible amount of community support. And this is what is possible when progressive food policy meets that same community action and experience. Soul Food Farms, the city of, of Vancouver, Green City Acres in Kelowna, BC, Growing Power in Milwaukee, D-Town Farms in Detroit, Michigan, they're setting a new bar for what is possible when we grow food in the city. And in the case of Vancouver, they've crafted a 20-year food strategy that is allowing some really incredible progressive food policies in place. And it's allowing dozens and dozens of urban farmers in Vancouver to really thrive in an urban food movement. And Victoria is not far behind. We have incredible civic leaders and we have incredible community organizations that are working on a long-term food strategy for southern Vancouver Island. And they are working also very hard on, a, on creating a community food system that is accessible. And behind me here is Victoria's community food system. I'll just introduce you to the elements. We have our producers and our growers. We have our our retailers, distributors, and processors, our consumers, and our waste stream to complete the cycle. Every element needs work, and many, if not all, community food systems around the world are broken. The, the element that I'm going to discuss right now is the, is the consumer element, it's the issue of access. And we can't really begin to have an honest discussion about access to local organic food until we discuss why people can't afford it. Because organic food, local organic food, is actually really cheap. But it becomes very expensive when you have to ensure that you have a roof over your head, you have clothes on your body, you have a way to and from work, you have someone to take care of your children, and you have a way to keep your body warm at night. When those bases are covered, organic food becomes a luxury. It's not a right. So how, how can we fix this broken food system in our world? Well, we can start by securing one community food system at a time. You can take a look behind me and see where you can plug in, because there are many, many jobs that, be, that can be created from a community food system. A thriving urban food movement creates global citizens that are ecologically literate and are food literate. And they can start connecting the dots between Typhoon Haiyan and the decisions that they're making in their everyday lives. And most importantly, we can be seeing how we can help diversify the demographic that has access to the skills and knowledge that are needed to build this new world, because a carbon-free and a nuclear-free energy economy is upon us, and it is totally possible, especially with the revolutionary work that is being done by thousands of grassroots organizations throughout the world. But we need to break free from this present destructive and oppressive system, because that revolutionary work it can't be fully realized within the confines of a capitalist system. Because essentially, what we, are, what we are witnessing today is a boxing match between the climate and capitalism. And capitalism is trying every dirty trick in the book. Capitalism has been punching below the belt for way too long, but the climate is playing the long game. And the climate is going to win. And our leading climate scientists are telling us that it is the decisions that we make in the next seven to 10 years that will determine the future of the planet and whether or not we have a place in, the, in that future. So we can choose to react to the actions of the corporate global elite and, and climate catastrophe, or we can prepare for that uncertain future and arm ourselves with the skills and knowledge that are needed to weather the storm that is coming. And my hope is that our future will include a community food system where everybody has a seat at the table, not just those that can afford it. Thank you.